Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this episode, we're going to take those complex designs you've created using layout guides, and we're going to transform the guides themselves, thereby taking those complex designs and launching them into the stratosphere. And as a side effect, blowing people's minds. It really is ridiculous how simple it is to create incredibly complex designs using the techniques we're going to talk about today. There's a lot to cover in transformations for layout guides, so I've split it into two. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the transformations themselves and how to animate those transformations. Well, we've got a lot to cover. Let's get into it. Right, a couple of housekeeping things before we start. The first is that we're going to need pure Swift UI to do this. Uh, I did mention it in the intro and it is rather important since without it, none of this is going to work at all. You'll find a link for that repository in the description below. I'm also using Xcode 12, which has a more reliable internal simulator, particularly for animations. As far as styling goes, I've got our view in a greedy frame. I've got it on a background color of nearly black. I'm ignoring safe areas and I'm showing the layout guides. Lastly, I've got some animation going on here. I'm using an ease in out with a duration of two to animate our shape when I click it. Now, if you're confused about anything to do with the animation or animatable data or any of that, do have a look at episode four in this series where we look at animating points. And I go into some detail about animations themselves, making what we're going to do today a little easier to follow. So what have we got in front of us? We've got two shapes, one of which is based on a polar layout and one is based on a grid. I've commented out the grid for now because we're going to look at that in the next episode. And what you're seeing right now is a representation as a stroke of the layout guide itself. So yes, I am showing the layout guide, but I'm also stroking that layout guide as the shape. If I delete this actual shape definition, then what you'll see is just the layout guide. So that's the layout guide we've got going for us right there. We're going to pretend that that is our shape and we're going to transform it and see what we can really do. So let's say that we wanted to rotate this thing. So when we click it, we actually want it to rotate 360 degrees. Well, that's very easy because all we need to do is transform the layout guide itself. We're defining the layout guide on line 50. And what we want to do is to add a transformation to that. And the way we do that, if we're rotating, is like this. We say it's rotated 360 degrees. Now, if I leave it at that, which I will do, okay, nothing's changed because it's rotated 360 degrees and it's exactly the same. Uh, even if I click on it, like nothing is going to happen. All right. In order to get the animation working with this, we need to provide it with a factor. And that's because with transformations, they will assume that you want to do it unless you tell it you only want to do it for a certain factor. So what's happened here is I've said I want to rotate it 360 degrees and the framework says, yeah, fine. OK, done. No problem at all. And you'll see that if I just change that to, say, 10. All right there it is rotated 10 degrees. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the animatable data. So it just rotates it by 10 degrees. If I want that rotation to be based on the animatable data property that we've got, then I need to tell it. I need to say that the factor is animatable data. And when I click on it, it rotates 10 degrees. OK, I've got it set up to two seconds. Let's make it 45 degrees. A bit more obvious. There it is, rotating 45 degrees. And now we can set in 360 degrees. It's going to go all the way around in two seconds, right? Lovely. So that's how you tie in your animatable data to the transformation itself. So we can transform them and we can transform them based on a factor. And that factor essentially goes from zero to one, but it's not restricted to that. And what I mean by that is that if we're rotating 360 degrees, that will happen over the course of factor going from zero to one. However, if I did it from zero to two, it would actually rotate 720 degrees like this. If I did a times two, then what we're going to see 
it actually rotates twice for the same animatable data change. And if I do it by half, it will only go halfway around. Now you also have the option to go from and to a certain value. So if I set that back to animatable data, then I can say from, say, minus 45 degrees to 45 degrees. And what will happen is it will go from minus 45 degrees to plus 45 degrees. So you have an awful lot of flexibility with what you can actually achieve in these transformations. So let's get it back to 360 degrees. All right, lovely. That's where we want to be to move forward. So now we've done a rotation. What we want to do now is we want to do a scaling. So we can say scaled 0 0.5. All right, that scales it by 0.5 in both dimensions, X and Y. So very nice. This is what we're looking for. And what I want to do now is I want it to go from the left all the way over to the right, which means I want to offset it from minus half the width to plus half the width. And the way I would do that is I would use the offset modifier. So I would say an X offset from minus half the width to plus half the width. And that is going to be controlled by animatable data. So now as it runs, it rotates, it scales. Now you're going to find when you start playing around with these things that there are many extensions that will make your life a lot easier when working with paths and essentially points, sizes, rectangles and all of those things. So I'm going to be using some of them here, but you really need to explore because there are some really useful ones in there. For example, just look at the way I'm calculating the transformed height of the layout guide on line 55. I'm creating a CG size with the square extension, and then I'm taking the bottom of the layout guide and calculating the distance to the top, where radius 2 is an extension on CG point that calculates the absolute distance to another point. They can save you a lot of time and clean up your code tremendously. Now, let's have a little bit of fun here because this um, rotation that we're seeing, it doesn't really look very good because it's rotating faster than it's offsetting. It doesn't really look like it's rolling, which I think would be nice. Uh, in fact, let's give it a road on which to roll. Okay, so let's set it back to its uh, original position. Let's just give ourselves a little bit more space here so we can see the code a bit better. Uh, and I'm going to draw a line down the center. Path, line, from the leading edge of the rectangle to the trailing edge of the rectangle. That gives us a line, and that's the road that I want to roll our wheel down, okay? So in order to get that onto that line, I'm going to extract out this value here. Right, transformed height. And move that up. And then I can use it here. So I can now make more transformations to G equals G with a Y offset of minus the transformed height times 0.5. Right, so now we've got something that is rolling on top of that line, but it's slipping. So how do we fix that slipping? Well, thanks to the wonders of circular geometry, what we know is, is that in order to make that transition from left to right, it is rolling its entire circumference all the way to the other side. So what we need to do is make sure that the circumference of the circle is equal to the width of the line that we are rolling on top of. So the line we're rolling along is equal to 2r, two times the radius. The circumference of the wheel is equal to 2 pi and then the radius of the wheel. And if you do the algebra, it works out, we need the scale to be 1 over pi. 
Simple as that. We need to say that instead of 0.5, this needs to be 1 over 1 over pi. Now watch this. Look at that. Beautiful. It's rolling along our road. Now, I know that we, this is all very exciting, but what I'm trying to show is how powerful these transformations are. No matter how complex your design, you can then transform it in all of these ways and make incredibly complicated looking shapes without having to worry about scattering loads of calculations throughout your code. I don't know how you would do this natively. If anyone wants to take up the challenge and recreate what I've got on the screen here natively in Swift UI using paths, um, I don't have the time to do it, but I think it would take a very long time and a lot of trigonometry obfuscating everything. Uh, so what we end up with is clean code that says exactly what we're trying to do. And then the drawing of it is just a couple of lines. It really is very powerful. Right, so that's transformations covered. And in the next episode, we're going to be looking at how we can use transformations to create complex shapes that contain repeated patterns or some kind of symmetry or something like that. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you like what you're seeing here, then give it a thumbs up to help people find the place and drive a shard of joy straight into my heart. If you want to see more of this kind of stuff, then consider subscribing and you'll get it. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.